let's talk about some spectroscopic measurements and, and the instruments that what's like what's underneath the hood when you make a spectroscopic measurement. So you can do this for a bunch of different spectroscopies. I'm sure you can even do it for microwave um, for like weather predicting weather. Um, but we're going to talk about infrared, visible and UV ultraviolet, so UV vis, um, and we might even get a little bit into some x-ray stuff, but we're going to really focus on the UV vis. Um, so essentially the basics of a UV vis measurement are source, monochromator, uh, sample, and detector. And so most um, UV vis instruments are going to have those components, at least in some way. So let's talk about sort of the simplest uh, case. So we have a source, usually you have a tungsten, deuterium arc, uh, tungsten and deuterium arc lamp as sources, and they just switch in the middle um, at 360 nanometers. Uh, tungsten goes from 250 or 2500 nanometers, so near IR, to 320, and the deuterium arc goes from the UV uh, to 110 nanometers over to 400. So um, you could use a couple of, so those are the sources. Um, you need some kind of monochromator to differentiate wavelengths. So you can either use a prism, which works on refraction, or a grating, which works on diffraction. Um, we're, we're mostly, I think gratings are much more common, and so that's what we're going to focus on. Um, so then you need a sample, um, easy peasy, and then a detector. And so if you're looking, if, if with this sort of setup, you're going to probably be doing a single wavelength at a time. Um, as you scan your monochromator, so you only need to de detect one wavelength at a time, so you're going to use a photomultiplier tube, where you have a photosensitive cathode where the uh, light photons come in and hit it, that generates electrons, and then you have a series of dynodes that multiply that electron because they're at progressively higher, um, higher voltages. So you start with maybe 90 volts and then 180, and it's, it's a difference of 90 volts every time. So you add 90 volts every time. So those electrons, you know, one hits and it's a cascade effect. Like three more rush on to the next uh, dynode. And then eventually you get over to the anode. And you can get a 10 to the 6 um, amplification using this method. So that's a, called a photomultiplier tube. So let's look in a little bit more detail at a monochromator. So you have white light coming in um, through the entrance slit. You're going to have a concave mirror that collimates the light. Um, and then you're going to have a diffraction grating, which gonna, is going to break it into its component wavelengths. So you're going to, and then, and then that wavelength dispersed light um, is going to come up and hit a second concave mirror, and that's going to focus it a single wavelength down onto the entrance slit, or sorry, to the exit slit. So then that, that one wavelength can go on um, through the optics. So um, the first uh, diagram of an instrument, the first block diagram of an instrument, was a little bit simplistic because um, if you want to have really good um, re reproducibility and you want to have the lowest signal to noise possible, you want to do something like a double beam UV vis. So where you have the source, monochromator is the same, then you would have a physical chopper that goes around on a little, uh, it rotates through, and so part of the time the light is getting bounced off and going to the reference, and part of the time it's just going straight through, through the sample. Um, so then you have light either through the reference or through the sample, then they come back together through a partially silvered mirror, and then they go to the detector. And that's, um, so these cuvettes, whatever your sample's in, needs to, need to be closely matched. Same path link and, and everything, and then same uh, media, dilution media. So that way um, you really can isolate what, sam what signal is actually coming from the sample. Um, but th these double beam instruments, I'm sure that they're still a lot in use, but um, we actually have some, some really like way better technology now. Um, we can actually detect a bunch of different wavelengths all at the same time. So you, in this case, you would have the source, the sample, and then instead of having a full-blown monochromator, so you're having multi, many wavelength sources, or many wavelengths coming from your source, interacting with your sample all at the same time, and then um, you, your light would come in through an entrance slit, just like with a monochromator, and then get bounced off a mirror, collimated, and then the, the wavelength dispersed light goes and gets... Um, Put onto a, a photodiode or a CCD, and so you can actually detect all of these wavelengths all at the same time, which is very exciting because it's much much faster and uh, much easier to do it this way. You can detect them all at once, so that's pretty cool. 
All right, so let's talk for just a let's just sort of to review. Let's talk about the sources. So uh, if you want narrow or single wavelengths, you might use a laser LED or a mercury or xenon arc lamp. Um, if, but if you want many uh, broad wavelengths, you you would use a combination of the tungsten and um, deuterium arc lamp. Um, and then same thing for the detectors. If you only want to detect one wavelength, you can use a photomultiplier tube. Um, and then if you're interested in detecting all of the different wavelengths all at the same time, you might use a photodiode array or a CCD, a charge coupled device. Um, and for either one, you're going to need to use either a monochromator or a prism or something like that in order to, to, um, to disperse the wavelengths. Although I actually have seen some stuff where people actually use their iPhones as a spectrometer. So I'm not exactly sure how that works, but that would be an interesting thing. Alright, let's just uh, one more thing that I wanted to mention is um, that you can also do UV vis fluorescence. So you basically have the same source. You have a one mono that you can fix, mono number one that you can fix, which is before the sample, and then you have the sample, and then you have a second monochromator after the sample, and then the detector. So you can either scan mono one or mono two. If you scan mono 1, then you measure at a fixed wavelength, uh, so you have to fix mono 2, and that way you can do an excitation scan, or you can excite at a fixed wavelength, and then scan mono 2 and get an emission scan. And so, there's a picture of this in your, in your book, but basically, if you scan excitation, you're going to look at how, what the excitation is measuring at a single uh, emission, or at a single wavelength for the mono 2, or you can uh, fix mono one, say here, and then look at the excitation or at the um, emission lines from mono 